Hope this finds everyone well. Uh, today we're going to be doing um, chapter uh, 7 on inhalants in, uh, from the book Drug Society and hu Human Behavior. Not inhalants, depressants. Inhalants are depressant, but the category is depressant, not inhalant. So, uh, thank God for coffee. And uh, so we're going to get started on that this morning. And so uh, I'm going to share my screen with you and we're going to jump right in. Both feet. Here we go. The presence in inhalants. As I said, a huge category of, uh, of uh, drugs. They're a very, uh, very large uh, and uh, there's uh, around, uh, there's uh, almost 3,000 uh, barbiturates alone that are available out there. Well, not really available. A lot of them are uh, outdated. They don't, they're not prescribed anymore, but it's, the, the compounds are still floating around out there. Uh, and uh, this uh, the, the central nervous system depressants have one thing in common, that's they depress the central nervous system, and they have a, a general set of behavioral effects that are associated with them. Uh, and all of these drugs uh, cause an intoxication that's similar uh, to uh, alcohol consumption, or similar to being drunk, uh, not similar to being drunk. Uh, and these include the non-barbiturate sedatives, the barbiturates, the benzodiazepines, alcohol, uh, substances such as tuanol, which is a, a solvent, it's never was never meant for human consumption, uh, and, and others as well. In addition to sharing the same types of effects with, uh, with uh, ingestion, any of them, uh, they also uh, have um, behavioral effects that are common to them, and they have risk. Uh, they have physiological effects that are common to them that, that they're dangerous. At different dosages, each of them can be used for different purposes. Uh, some better than others, but at one dose, uh, this can be a sedative. At another dose, it can be an anxiolytic. At another dose, it can be a hypnotic. At another dose, it can be a tranquilizer. Uh, so it depends on the dosage. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, again, the uh, behavioral effects and the physiological effects, they're like taking uh, 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 other drugs such as alcohol. The more drinks you have, the drunker you are. The more pills, the larger dosages you have with these, uh, uh, the more intoxicated you become. They're all dangerous drugs. All of them uh, have the capability, basically, to cause an overdose. And overdoses are generally all fatal in the same way, which is respiratory uh, uh, Suppression. It shuts down the part of the brain that controls your breathing, and you stop breathing, and you suffocate. Uh, and they, uh, uh, the the second type of uh, uh, overdose effect you can find with these substances will be um, becoming passing out, getting sick, throwing up, and drowning in the vomit. Uh, and that's not a very glamorous way to go, huh? All of them are cross-addictive, and cross-addiction is extremely important with this class of drugs, and this was well, important with other classes of drugs too, but particularly with this one. Uh, and it's real hard sometimes to get your clients to wrap their heads around the idea that uh, if you are an alcoholic in recovery, you cannot safely use anxiolytics for the most part. It's, uh, your value, I mean, and, and there are people in recovery who are taking uh, uh, benzodiazepines such as Xanax or Librium or, or Valium or whatever. Uh, but, uh, you know, you're kind of playing with fire on that because these are the same type drugs as uh, uh, the alcohol. 
and it's like being addicted to the narcotics. You, you're not addicted to just morphine or heroin or opium or whatever. You're addicted to all of them in that family if you're addicted to one of them in that family. And that's true with this too. Uh, so cross addiction is, uh, it's not really a cross addiction because you're not, you, you are moved, you, if you're addicted to one drug, you are addicted to another, whether you use it or not but you're not really jumping to a different drug. I mean, all of these drugs are in the same family with the same property, and that's the issue with that. Uh, uh, we'll talk about that a little later on. And these are very widely prescribed. They're the most prescribed medication uh, in the United States. They are... Uh, depressants and consequently they slow activity in the central nervous system and you watch people who are taking them uh, they'll slur their words they'll stagger they'll fall asleep and pass out and things like that uh, and, ex and exhibit the same uh, type of uh, uh, symptoms of intoxication that anyone doing any of them will do. It doesn't matter if it's secondol, or if it's barbiturates, if it's methquilone, if it's alcohol, um, if it's benzodiazepines. When you get intoxicated on them, the intoxication is pretty much the same. Again, uh, they can be used for multiple purposes uh, pharmacologically and are prescribed for multiple purposes purposes pharmacologically, but they're also used for more nefarious purposes, such as date rape. And uh, also uh, uh, the ultimate big casino uh, suicide. Uh, people will take these uh, pills to, uh, to kill themselves. So what, the, the, these are the uses, and, and sometimes it's confusing. Sedatives are given to relax someone, to calm them down, to, to create a state of sedateness. Uh, tranquilizers are usually used as, as a deeper type of, uh, uh, of sedation to reduce tension, or a less type of sedation uh, to reduce tension or anxiety. And, uh, uh, you know, you, uh, to, to immobilize someone, uh, like a bear. <laughs> with one of those uh, tranquilizer dart guns. Uh, anxiolytic is one that reduces anxiety. Hypnotic is uh, a use uh, that is to induce sleep, to make you uh, fall asleep. Inhalants, uh, they can be used for anesthesia primarily. They, uh, in this family of drugs, in this category, they uh, knock you down so you can have a, a take a few huffs of laughing gas and the, the dentist can do a tooth extraction or, uh, you know, dental surgery or something. Um, and uh, ether and chloroform and those type of uh, drugs. And they're used for intoxicant purposes. And again, a lot of the inhalants, even though they're used for intoxicant purposes, are things that are were never meant for humans to use in that matter. They're not for human consumption. Uh, and when you look at some of the uh, containers, for instance, look at the spray cans on common inhalants that are abused, and they'll all tell you, use in a well-ventilated area, avoid breathing the fumes, etc., uh, because they're dangerous, uh, and they are. Uh, these drugs can be prescribed as anticonvulsives. They prevent seizures. Phenobarbital was used forever for that. Dilantin, another barbiturate, is used as an uh, anticonvulsive. And uh, the antipsychotics or major tranquilizers are those that are uh, uh, knocking people down who are experiencing psychotic episodes. Uh, chlorpromazine or Thorazine, if you come in the unit and you're uh, wildly psychotic and not behaving properly, we'll pop you with some Thorazine, uh, and the next thing you know, it's not Wednesday anymore, it's Sunday, and you don't know where the rest of the week is going, but you've been very manageable. Uh, how Peridol, some other types of antipsychotic medications are uh, basically... Uh, 
uh, well, antipsychotic medications do two things. One, they uh, uh, sedate you to the point that you're no longer psychotic. Uh, and two, uh, other medications are trying to create a balance of chemicals that are probably out of whack, causing the psychosis in the first place. The same depressant substance uh, may, at different dosages, be prescribed for any of the uses uh, listed above. For instance, a benzodiazepine uh, anxiolytic can be used to, uh, uh, to create sedation if you give people enough of it or, or to tranquilize people, and it uh, will cause you to go to sleep. Uh, some, of the, some medications, some substances that you have out there uh, are fall into different types of categories, but will still have uh, certain effects that are similar to these. For instance, uh, 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 Benadryl. Uh, if you take a uh, uh, Benadryl tablet, uh, and it's for allergy medication, uh, you'll very likely get sleepy, which is why uh, Benadryl, the antihistamine, is not uh, particularly uh, uh, well received in halfway houses and uh, hospital settings, treatment settings. Uh, same may be said of hydroxyzine, which is a uh, uh, another one that is given. Uh, it can be used as an anxiolytic to reduce anxiety, but uh, it's also prescribed to do things like alleviate itching if you have a skin <laughs> condition. Uh, and it also has a hypnotic effect to, to induce sleep. None of these drugs are drugs that you should be taking if you're doing anything that might otherwise be important, like driving a car uh, or anything uh, like that, operating uh, other equipment, uh, uh, swimming, skiing, diving, any of that kind of stuff. Is, uh, they're very risky, and they shouldn't be mixed. These shouldn't be mixed even with over-the-counter things. It shouldn't be mixed with alcohol. It shouldn't it? There's a lot of things you shouldn't mix with these. So uh, they're um, uh, used the way they're supposed to be used. They're generally pretty safe. But when you get into abusing them, then they become dangerous. Back in the day, uh, there was always alcohol. Uh, alcohol is probably the oldest uh, central nervous system uh, uh, depressant used by human beings. Uh, it causes intoxication, and I don't think I have to explain much about the intoxication that people experience when they're when they're drinking. Uh, it uh, uh, messes with your coordination. It uh, uh, fogs your uh, mind where you can't think straight. In fact, you're basically, while you're under the influence of alcohol, pretty much out of your mind, insane, not incapable of uh, uh, using good judgment and reason and that kind of thing. Uh, you exempt, exhibit the symptomologies of being poisoned. You stagger, you lose coordination, you slur your words. Uh, it's a crude anesthesia. If you drink enough of it fast enough, I can amputate your leg and you won't wake up. Uh, it's also a real good date rape drug. Uh, and that has been, and probably the oldest of the date rape drugs, going back as far as you can imagine. Uh, it's been romanticized in our culture, you know, as something that, uh, you know, it uh, brings men and women closer together and allows intimacy and stuff like that, which frankly is BS. Um, and uh, if your uh, date is comatose, that is not consent. And that is not an aphrodisiac quality, but anyway, the arguments are still made. Also back in the day, they had other substances, chloral hydrate, uh, also known as knockout drops. Uh, you may have seen this in the cartoons there where Bugs gets the knockout drops and he mixes it in a, a glass and there's a mushroom cloud rises up out of the glass and the spoon he stirred it with looks like a spent match. It's burned up on the end uh, and then he gives it to Elmer or whomever. Uh, this was a very dramatic episode of uh, Tom and Jerry 
uh, where Jerry Mouse has been antagonizing Tom the Cat, uh, and Jerry's as big a villain in this, by the way, as Tom is most of the time. He's a he's a real little jerk. Uh, and he's been antagonizing Tom the cat, and Tom will get after him, and then he'll run over to Butch the bulldog who will wake up and kick Tom's butt. Uh, and uh, Tom uh, slipped Butch and Mickey. <laughs> Those are the knockout drops. And the term uh, slipped me and Mickey if you like film noir, if you like to watch the films of uh, the old black and white films of the 40s and 50s uh, uh, with the hard-bitten detectives, uh, you know, uh, and them, uh, Humphrey Bogart and whatnot, uh, someone slipped me a Mickey and I woke up, you know, uh, the next day not knowing how I got to this apartment and what I was doing there, but the gun was in my hand and this person was dead. It became a plot for a lot of movies. Uh, it was a plot for Tom and Jerry. Jerry has just discovered what Tom has done to Butch and he can't wake him up to protect him anymore. Uh, very dramatic, I recommend that episode. Uh, anyway, it came to be called Mickey Finn, uh, allegedly because there was a bartender in Chicago named Mickey Finn, who would uh, dose uh, some of his uh, patrons at his bar uh, with chloral hydrate. You put a few drops in a drink and it will knock someone down. And uh, they'll have problems with their memory afterwards coming out of it. But, uh, uh, and the, the ladies who, uh, uh, the, the working girls in his bar uh, would then uh, roll these men and, um, you know, rip them off, take their valuables and stuff. Uh, and so that, he, uh, the, the story is that it came to be called Mickey Fan after this particular bartender. Uh, there's another uh, 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 legend that goes along with the use of chloral hydrate that this is how Irishmen wound up in the British Navy. They're drinking in a pub in Dublin and they wake up, they're on a boat for the South China Sea. Uh, and now you're in the Navy now, uh, so that's why that went, allegedly. These are also known as, uh, uh, like I said, knockout drops, because that's what they do. They, you mix them with alcohol, and the response is to put you down pretty quickly. Chloral hydrate is a good uh, uh, central nervous system depressant to help, people, uh, to help people sleep or to calm them down or whatever. Uh, there's not much respiratory suppression that happens with, uh, with chloral hydrate used alone. Now, if you mix it with alcohol, you get a much increased respiratory suppression effect. Uh, and if um, uh, uh, you're taking chloral hydrate, anytime you take a medication, it can alter things in your brain. We've established that already, right? And sometimes... Uh, you want to avoid any kind of damage to the organ. So you, you might see chloral hydrate used a lot in intensive care units and uh, rehabilitation centers and places like that where they want to sedate their patients and they want to bring them down, but they don't want any residual damage to the brain, and uh, which uh, chloral hydrate doesn't produce a lot of. It's safe to use with brain damage. Uh, patients, or safer, let me put it that way, to use with brain damaged patients than some of the others. Also in the good old days, uh, we had bromides, although you didn't hear them mentioned much in the movie version of Dracula. Uh, the, um, uh, this is uh, Bela Lugosi, and he had a Romanian accent, and it really played well for him in the 30s and 40s. Uh, Bram Stoker's novel, was a modern novel. It was set on the edge of the Victorian era, and they were doing uh, all kinds of things in there that were uh, uh, very modern for, for their time. Uh, Mina Harker typed on a, uh, um, uh, on a typewriter. She used a typewriter instead of a pen and ink. Dr. Seward 
uh, recorded his notes on a gramophone, the cylinder recording device that he could, cylindrical recording device that he could speak into and then play it back later. Uh, very uptown in 1912 when this was recorded. Uh, actually been around for a while by 1912. Uh, but he also used bromides, and bromides are, uh, are elements. They're uh, bromide, bromine is an element on the, uh, you know, the elemental table if you're into uh, an organic chemistry or organic chemistry. Um, and uh, so this, uh, these salts were mixed together with other things and, and uh, given to people. Uh, and Dracula, uh, uh, key setting, and uh, uh, several key settings, Carfax Abbey was one of them, Castle Dracula was another, uh, but yet another was the, uh, uh, the asylum uh, for the mentally ill. Uh, they called it an insane asylum for people who were insane. Uh, and they took patients in there like Renfield, the guy who liked to collect souls by eating flies and bugs and stuff and was trying to talk them into giving them a kitten. Uh, the, uh, uh, so uh, he, he got dosed with bromides uh, fairly uh, regularly. So did Lucy and Mina, uh, the, the two uh, female protagonists in uh, Dracula. And, uh, Lucy and Mina both were acting weird after their exposure to Count Dracula. This is also a novel of sexual predation, by the way. Uh, one of Dracula's powers is the power to, uh, to cloud his victims' minds. It's like a sedation. It's even a metaphor for sedation. Uh, the women not only uh, submit to it, but in many cases they look forward to it. And Dracula comes into their room and he visits them while they're supine in bed and he uh, uh, seduces them and sedates them and he penetrates them and there's an exchange of body fluids. And in uh, Lucy's case, she becomes one of the undead. Uh, uh, she's in the middle. She's neither living or dead. She's like Dracula. Uh, but... The women, the, part of the horror of Dracula is the women begin to act in ways that aren't ladylike. It's not so much what they become as what they no longer are, and they are not uh, uh, ladylike. They're not acting like female, uh, like Victorian females are supposed to act, right? Uh, they prey on men. They come to men. They penetrate men. They... Uh, uh, transform men. It's uh, very, very macho stuff. And so men have to free them in Dracula. And uh, the way they free them, again, is through male penetration, stalking them down to the, uh, to the coffins where they sleep and driving a stake through their heart and freeing their souls. Uh, what do you do with women who aren't acting right? You can't drive stakes through them, not legally, right? You drug them. That's how you deal with hysterical females. And you got to have a uterus to be hysterical, right? That's Dr. Freud. Uh, so that's um, an element of that. Uh, and uh, bromides were the things that were used uh, uh, in psychiatric uh, approaches to, um, uh, uh, you know, to deal with mental illness uh, or hysteria. Hysteria was something that was... Uh, diagnosed in women at the turn of the century, and that's how you dealt with them. This is a compound of, uh, of uh, bromine. Again, the bromides were relatively safe in the short haul. Uh, if you got Lucy being hysterical in the hallway right now, give her some bromines. But you don't want to do that to her two or three times a day or every day, uh, you know, every day, several times a day, or for prolonged periods of time because the toxicity builds over time and with increased usage. Because of changes that occur and, and uh, tolerance, as we've already established, uh, if you have an increased tolerance to consistent exposure of this drug, you're going to have to take more of it to get where you used to go with less of it. Uh, and then uh, when, you, uh, when you do that, uh, 
you're getting into high levels of usage over time and that increases uh, unwanted effects. That also uh, creates dangerous sedation levels in there. And if you take enough of these things, they, like other CNS depressants, will shut down uh, your breathing. Also, it gives you bad skin. You get rashes and things with this and upset stomachs and whatnot. Same with chloral hydrate. Uh, not, the, not the rashes, but the stomach problems. This is a, from the yellow wallpaper. She shall be as sick as she pleases. Uh, the Yellow Wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman, which is a short story that I'm going to post on uh, in our classroom for you, so that uh, it will it will be posted in your classroom for you, uh, so that you can go there and read it and uh, write a, a paper on it, a short response paper, uh, if you want to, is for extra credit. You don't have to, but um, it's a great short story. You ought to read it anyway. A woman goes to the countryside where she's placed in a room in a house that her husband has rented uh, for her health, for her to recover. Her husband is also her doctor, uh, and this lady goes quietly insane uh, inside, this, uh, inside this room, uh, and she begins to hallucinate and see things behind the yellow wallpaper, faces, and a woman who creeps. Uh, and her husband, she tells her husband she wants to leave and she doesn't think she's getting any better. And he, very patronizingly, says to her, well, look at her. She shall be as sick as she pleases, won't she? Uh, and uh, it's not a good idea, by the way, uh, to have your husband prescribe for you, you know? Uh, because what do we do with women who aren't acting right? I heard that, yeah, you drug them. Uh, and you drug them to the point that they are acting right. By the way, this is something uh, that we need to consider in terms of the ethics of this type of practice. Uh, we drug men, women, and children who aren't acting the way we want them to act, and we sedate them or we cause a physical change or a psychic change or a way of thinking or feeling change until they are acting the way we want to do it. We want them to. And they may not be dissatisfied with themselves. Uh, there's a pretty good movie. Uh, it was an okay movie. It was, but it raised some interesting issues called uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Jones or Mr. Johnson. I think it's Mr. Johnson uh, with uh, uh, Richard Gere in it playing a bipolar fella. Uh, and uh, he told his psychiatrist at one point she was lecturing him on, on him uh, using his drugs, which he always promised to do, but when they let him out of the hospital, he threw them away because he didn't like them. Uh, we'll talk about that later on in other chapters, too. Uh, but the line, the thing that I thought was important was when he answered her back honestly. He said, you're trying to turn me into who you want me to be. Uh, and I don't want to be that. See, I bother you. I don't bother me. I'm okay with the way I am. Uh, so do we, or should we even, really be interfering with people who um, are managing to make it so far, aren't they? Uh, anyway, interesting thing. Uh, the uh, uh, notion uh, that uh, you drug women who aren't acting right and that you aren't acting right by drugging these women was an issue that uh, was taken up by Gilman in the late 1800s. It's a good story. Bromides, by the way, were what they were giving her. This is Dr. Bob Smith, the co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. In the big book, uh, there's a chapter in there called Dr. Bob's Nightmare. And it's uh, uh, Bob Smith's uh, uh, story. And Bob was in and out of uh, detox units, alcohol treatment wards. They tried everything that they had available at the time uh, to help him out, including drugging him so that he would act right, even though he wasn't a woman. Uh, and um, uh, in uh, Dr. Bob's nightmare, he talks about consuming a, a big glass of bleach lightning 
Well, that was peraldehyde, another non-barbiturate sedative. Peraldehyde is another good drug. It's a good drug. It's not widely used right now, uh, but uh, it was in Dr. Bob's time. And they would give these men uh, uh, peraldehyde, generally in liquid form. Uh, you can get it otherwise. You can take pills, and that's, it can be injected. But they would generally give it to them just oral dosages. Uh, and or, the oral dose peraldehyde uh, would cause a slight intoxication, but it would uh, uh, it would also eliminate the delirium tremens up here. This is from Huckleberry Finn, and there's an episode in uh, Huckleberry Finn in the book, and it translated to this up here, the first film, that's Huck, that's Pap. Uh, and uh, Pap uh, decided in his delirium tremens that Huck was a devil and he was going to kill him. And Huck was trying to convince him that he was just Huck. Uh, and so around the cab the cabin they ran until uh, Pap was too worn out to kill him anymore. And um, he said he'd sleep it off and then kill him when he woke up. And Huck escaped. Uh, Anyway, uh, that's delirium tremens. Delirium tremens are dangerous, not just for Huck, but for Pap, too. Uh, a lot of people who go into DTs will die in DTs. So we still treat uh, people who are detoxing from alcohol and other central nervous system depressants. We still treat them with central nervous system depressants because it eliminates that dangerous withdrawal. And for someone who's physiologically addicted to alcohol, the withdrawal is dangerous. It can kill them. Uh, so peraldehyde is safe. It's effective. Uh, it stinks. Uh, you can smell someone who's been drinking it like they've been eating kimchi. Y'all like kimchi? It's a Korean cabbage dish, but it's, uh, but they ferment it. And, um, uh, you know, as a matter of fact, you can drink it and get drunk. But, uh, uh, the, the kimchi uh, is a uh, is a delicacy with the with the uh, uh, with the Koreans, and you can smell someone who's been eating it a block away. Uh, it's delicious, but it doesn't smell good. Uh, you can still smell uh, in old hospitals and jails and things like that where peraldehyde was used with uh, uh, to. Uh, calm the withdrawals and keep, uh, you know, keep people from having the, uh, the, the rum fits or the heebie-jeebies, uh, you can still smell peraldehyde on the units. Uh, all of those were largely replaced with barbiturates, which were uh, brought to you by Bayer Laboratories. Danke, Herr Dr. Bayer. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and then other drugs that were developed uh, beyond that. Uh, Barbara's urates replaced the non-barbiturate sedatives, chloral hydrate, bromides, and uh, uh, peraldehyde. Interesting how they got their names. The urates were elements that uh, are, are chemicals that can be found in human urine, uh, and, uh, including uremic acid. And uh, the the uh, these compounds. One story says that the the compound uh, was his first compounds. Doctor Bayer's first compounds were perfected around the day of the feast of Saint Barbara, uh, and so they were called Barbara's urates, barbiturates, uh, uh, in honor of uh, Saint Barbara, which is a, a nice story. <coughs> Another story is that the uremic acid was collected from a barmaid named Barbara, which is not a nice, so nice a story, but uh, interesting nevertheless. Uh, but um, uh, whether it was named for a person who, uh, or for a saint or for whomever, uh, Barbara's urates, they uh, became widely used in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, these uh, 
drugs are, as I mentioned before, is a huge uh, is a huge classification of drug. There's between uh, 20, uh, 2,500 and uh, uh, 3,000 of them available or, you know, out there right now today. Uh, and uh, they're grouped according to the duration of action into three types. There's short-acting uh, barbiturates and intermediate-acting and then long-acting. And it's the uh, short-acting barbiturates that have the highest potential for addiction. And we've talked about why already. Uh, if a drug uh, hits you fast and hits you hard and then wears off fairly quickly, uh, you're probably going to do it again. Uh, it, uh, that type of effect increases the likelihood that you'll fall into a pattern of use, and that pattern of use will also lead uh, to addiction uh, through physiological changes that happen with you and uh, changes in tolerance levels and things like that. Also, the way you uh, apprehend that drug, the way you feel about it. If it's a good thing and desirable, you'll want to do it some more. Uh, if it makes you feel good. That, by the way, I'll, let me reinforce that. That's why people go back and use the drug again some more anyway. Uh, you use it once, your curiosity is satisfied. You use it once and uh, it helps you go to sleep at night, but you like the feeling that took you there to, to go to sleep. And so you go back and you use it again and again and again some more. Uh, the uh, uh, these are uh, drugs that are uh, ha that have always been associated with overdose uh, death, and um, particularly if they're in combination with alcohol, they're drugs that people go to. They're go-to drugs for intentional uh, suicides. Uh, they're responsible for the death of uh, Brian Epstein the fifth Beatle, the manager of the Beatles back in the day. Uh, Marilyn Monroe, uh, a drop-dead gorgeous woman who was a, a, a screen icon for, uh, for years. Uh, and um, she died because uh, she took a bunch of sleeping pills and washed it down with whiskey. Same with uh, Margot Hemingway, Muriel's sister, uh, up here. Another... Uh, uh, beautiful, stupefyingly beautiful. She walked into a room and, you know, just knocked people out. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, successful model, actress, etc. Uh, and granddaughter of Ernest Hemingway, the writer. Son also rises for whom the bell tolls. Islands in the strain. That guy. Uh, sleeping pills and alcohol. John N. Whistle. Uh, uh, base man for the Who, sleeping pills and alcohol. Jimi Hendrix uh, changed the musical world, rock to rock, uh, playing his right-handed guitar upside down because that's how he learned to play it. Uh, he was left-handed. Um, that's Jimi Hendrix. Uh, and he left... Uh, sleeping pills and, and whiskey. The, uh, these are prescribed primarily as sedatives or hypnotics, although some of them are prescribed as anticonvulsives. I mentioned uh, what, a moment ago, phenobarbital and, uh, and dilantin particularly. The uh, barbiturates uh, were replaced uh, by uh, by uh, uh, mepropamide, or, or mepropamide was the first of the drugs that came along to to uh, uh, to uh, replace barbiturates. And there were we by, by the mid fifties, everybody knew that these were uh, that the barbiturates were drugs that could be misused, that could be dangerous, that could cause uh, people to die. Uh, that type of thing had overdose risks associated with them. And mepropamate uh, was uh, patented in 1952. It was a, a unique and new uh, type of CNS depressant. Uh, and it was a, approved for use in 1955 and became uh, one of the most popular drugs ever. It was uh, uh, widely prescribed and uh, 
based largely on a, uh, on a uh, uh, advertising campaign, publicity, and partly on uh, uh, and partly because doctors jumped on this as a safer replacement for barbiturates, and they were concerned uh, at what was going on with their patients to whom they had been prescribing uh, sedatives and tranquilizers and anxiolytics and, and sleeping pills that were all barbiturate in nature. So this was really the first of the so-called minor tranquilizer anxiolytics, uh, what we'll call anxiolytics today. And it was given to people with anxiety disorders, uh, which we used to call neuroses, if you'll remember, uh, Dr. Freud. Uh, uh, people who have uh, uh, phobias, for instance, uh, people who have uh, panic attacks, people who uh, uh, can't leave their homes, uh, agoraphobia, people who, uh, uh, any kind of the phobias. Uh, and this drug, uh, Meprobamate, was popular for a while. It was called Milltown, the first one. And, and there's a little picture of a Milltown with the mill and the stream running by it. And it's bucolic and kind of makes you want to uh, stick your toes in the stream, doesn't it? Uh, so it had a nice little uh, title that was, uh, the title itself was sort of commentative if you think about it. Uh, Anyway, uh, it had its little run of popularity, but it was replaced in the 60s uh, by uh, a new category of drugs that became really popular called the benzodiazepines. More on them in a minute. Uh, also in the 60s, we had methqualone. And these, uh, this right here is the famous quaalude. It is a quaalude. It is a lemon 714, Roarer 714s, uh, and there were different pills like this, and uh, uh, it, be it became popular uh, for a while in the United States. It, it came to the country around 1965, and uh, uh, it, w it was the main ingredient in quaaludes. It's a synthetic, uh, uh, a totally synthetic chemical that was uh, synthesized in India. It came to the, it was seen as a less toxic alternative to secobarbital and amobarbital. And secobarbital and amobarbital are uh, short acting uh, uh, barbiturates that are used primarily as hypnotics, as sleeping pills. So this came to the United States with, uh, uh, in 1965 with addiction potential not established. They weren't able to say at the time or were unwilling to say at the time is more like it, wh whether it was addictive or not. It is. And when you take them, uh, they make you pretty drunk pretty fast. Uh, and uh, my experience with them is the first thing that starts happening when I know that I'm coming off to a load is my lips and my fingertips start tingling. And after that, I really can't remember what to tell you about it. Uh, so these became popular drugs of abuse. Uh, on the streets, they were called lewds, quays, soapers, disco biscuits, Anna panty pills, uh, heroin for lovers, panty droppers, gorilla biscuits, 714s, etc. Uh, again, they have uh, the, the panty dropper heroin for lover bullshit is bullshit. Uh, they do not have aphrodisiac qualities and because your uh, date is semi-comatose does not mean that she's turned on, you know. Uh, and I'm not being sexist when I'm talking about she, by the way, because these type of drugs don't work for men. Uh, you know, uh, in fact, they work opposite. The spirit may be willing, but the flesh won't cooperate. Uh, so when the CNS depressants tend to uh, decrease a man's ability to perform. That's a nice way of saying it, huh? Yeah, okay. Uh, so uh, these drugs also seriously uh, 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 have uh, overdose potential. Uh, 
people have died and uh, and do die from taking these meth. Quaylones uh, been uh, became Schedule Two in 1973, uh, which uh, makes sense if you think about it. Uh, why did it have to wait till the 70s to become Schedule Two? I knew you knew that. It's because there weren't schedules in the United States until the passage of the 1970 Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act, right? Substance Abuse Prevention and Control Act. That established the schedules, and that was in 1970. So they couldn't have been a Schedule II in 1965 because there weren't schedules. Good. In 1973, they became Schedule II, which is they're uh, strictly regulated. Uh, they, they can be prescribed. They do have a legitimate medical purpose. Uh, but by, 1907, by 1985, they were Schedule I, and they had no medical use in the United States. They could not be prescribed in this country anymore. And methoquilone is legal only in research uh, projects. It's not... Uh, legal to be uh, to be used. Now these drugs can be moved on and off of the schedules depending on what's going on with the people who uh, uh, assign that designation to them. Uh, and uh, I don't think that methquilone is an evil substance, it's just a substance. And the way it was used was uh, not all that great. Uh, you can still get methquilone in this country. It's not manufactured in this country. It's brought in from elsewhere. Over here on the left is the French patent, uh, and it's still sold in Canada and Mexico. It's called Mandrax, uh, and you can uh, get that and bring it into the country, not necessarily legally. Uh, so, methquilone is still out there. That, this becomes a deal because in 1985, uh, when uh, this was moved on to the Schedule One, no uh, uh, legitimate medical uses. This was the time that I was going uh, that I was entering the field of substance abuse counseling and working at, uh, for comprehensive psychiatric programs of America over in Deer Park, DAPA, Drug Abuse Programs of America. And um, I saw people coming in who were addicted to methquilone, they thought had been using methquilone, like kids were doing methquilone, except it, it wasn't methquilone, it was bootleg pills and it had other stuff in it. So uh, when you're buying black market products, you cannot uh, you cannot uh, uh, <coughs> guarantee their purity. I've even seen the names of the pills misspelled. <coughs> and they had all kinds of things in them. It was not methquilone. So methquilone went the way of the dinosaur in America. And... Uh, we saw the emergence, well, they had already emerged, uh, and that was the benzodiazepines, and they became uh, popular in the 60s, and uh, with the, uh, uh, with the uh, introduction of chlorodias epoxide, uh, which is Librium, the first of the benzodiazepines in the 60s, uh, which was uh, a popular drug in itself, but was quickly dis uh, displaced by uh, diazepam uh, or Valium and this is Lou Reed of the Velvet Underground y'all remember him hey babes take a walk on the wild side uh, life without Valium is like living underwater uh, and uh, you know he should be able to speak to some of that uh, there's pressure everywhere right? <laughs> if you're living underwater uh, and um, but uh, uh, Lou, unfortunately, a brilliant, brilliant artist, was uh, uh, also fascinated by any drug he could catch. Uh, and he died a couple of years ago, complications of liver failure uh, from hep C and things like that, and he caught that too. Anyway, 
Uh, the benzodiazepines are a large family of minor tranquilizers. They're used primarily as anxiolytics. And an anxiolytic is a drug that does what? Exactly. It uh, alleviates anxiety so that if you're anxious, you can take some of this and it uh, uh, makes you feel better. If you've got the shakes and find it hard to tranquilize, because, uh, fact, tranquilize, find it hard to concentrate uh, because you've stopped drinking lately, uh, doctors would write scripts for these uh, like nobody's business. Uh, and I can't remember the guy's name, he used to be the director of the uh, uh, substance abuse services for the U.S. Navy back in the 70s. And, uh, uh, late 70s, uh, well, throughout the 70s. I can't remember his name, but he said uh, he said he was never an alcohol abuser himself, uh, but he was an alcoholic abuser. Uh, and I was uh, listening to him speak one day, and uh, he, his uh, contention was uh, that uh, he had to find out uh, through his practice and, and working with people who were addicted to alcohol that alcohol really isn't a volume deficiency, uh, which was the common practice back then. If you were going to treat an alcoholic, you gave them pockets full of, uh, of volume. Uh, and uh, they, you know, you'd see people showing up at AA meetings who were whacked you know, on, on volume or taking their medicine, uh, which is the world's driest martini. And uh, they're still loaded, basically, because they're taking more of it than they're supposed to take. And, uh, and there you have it. Uh, but uh, these are good drugs to, these are good drugs to use with alcoholics initially and detox with people who are alcohol dependent and suffering withdrawal, uh, moving up toward or even into delirium tremens. If you're in a, if you're physiologically addicted to alcohol and wind up in a detox unit sometime or an emergency room, uh, one of the things they will do with you is give you what they call a yellow bag. And a yellow, it's called yellow because it's got a lot of potassium in it. That's the color of, uh, uh, you know, you look at the banana, high in potassium, it's yellow, that kind of thing. Uh, so you, you got a yellow drip uh, coming into your body. It looks like you're in, but it's not. Uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, but it's got potassium in it, which gives it that color, but it also probably has chlorodized epoxide in it uh, because Librium is a great drug uh, to give to alcoholics to stave off or to, uh, or to, uh, 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 to curtail the severity of withdrawal syndrome. And again, uh, for people who are physiologically addicted to alcohol, Withdrawal can prove uh, a, a, a serious, serious life-threatening event. People do die from uh, stopping drinking. The, the withdrawal symptoms will kill them. And they do die from uh, taking other central nervous system uh, depressants to the point of chronic addiction. The, the withdrawal will kill them. These are dangerous drugs. Uh, Valium. Uh, is still used in the treatment of alcoholics. Uh, and uh, I keep saying alcoholics. Uh, I probably shouldn't, but I've been doing this for so long, it's hard to break myself of the habit. Uh, alcohol use disordered people. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, they help with the shakes. They help with the withdrawal. They help keep the guys calm or the, uh, the patients come and put it that way, uh, and uh, so they're good drugs. Anxiolytics uh, have been again, uh, you know, targeted and questioned uh, by uh, ethicists and medical people about uh, uh, whether or not we should be prescribing them the way we do anyway. Valium was introduced in the in the late mid to late sixties. And by the 70s, it was the best-selling prescription uh, substance in the United States. We were selling more Valium than any other drug in America, and sometimes more than a lot of the other drugs combined. Uh, I read an article uh, back around uh, the mid-80s, and, it, and you know, it's just a piece of information that stuck with me. That if... Uh, 
1980, I think that was the year, 81, uh, and that's when drug use peaked in America, by the way. It peaked in, uh, around 1980 and it began to decline. The 70s was really a heyday of drug use. It was, uh, you know, but after when we rolled into the 80s, it began to it began to drop. We were doing prevention things. We had the Substance Abuse Prevention and Control Act, which worked in a lot of its initiatives. Uh, uh, but uh, drug use began to drop during that time. But again, at that time when it was peaking, uh, the the article said that if uh, if we took all of the Valium that was sold in that year, if we took it all at once as a nation, we could have overdosed every man, woman, and child in this country several times over. Not necessarily fatal overdose, but overdose. And uh, wow, wow, how much dope is that? Um, Baskins and Robbins should have had a Valium flavor in their selection because somebody out there really liked diazepam. Uh, anyway, these benzodiazepines are generally considered safe drugs. Uh, and if you take them as they're prescribed and you take them by themselves and don't mix them with other substances, uh, there's not much chance of an accidental overdose occurring. Although, you know, individual physiologies, uh, uh, differences and metabolic uh, systems, metabolic factors that take place from individual to individual, uh, you can, you know, still have something like that occur You're, that's not expected, an idiosyncratic effect. Uh, but generally speaking, there's not much chance of accidental overdose if you're just taking them by themselves as, as you're supposed to. Uh, when you start uh, uh, chasing a high with them or trying to maintain a high, uh, with them, then you start running overdose risk. And there's a high risk of overdose if you mix them with other CNS depressants, particularly ethanol. If you mix them with alcohol, you hardly ever see Valium uh, by itself uh, reflected in hospital records, people showing up to the emergency room. I mean, you know, people do OD on it and do show up with Valium in their system after a wreck or a fall or whatever. Uh, but uh, uh, where you really see it uh, getting into overdose areas is when people are mixing Valium with other things. And the thing that they most mix it with, uh, with disastrous consequences, is alcohol. Uh, the benzodiazepines do produce uh, dependence and uh, they can have a dangerous withdrawal. And they can have a dangerous withdrawal uh, one of the things that makes uh, the benzos or any CNS depressant uh, uh, dangerous with withdrawal of seizure activity and things like that. You can uh, begin to have seizures. And uh, if someone dies with uh, delirium tremens, for instance, withdrawing from alcohol, it'll usually be a heart attack while in the middle of a seizure. Uh, the uh, 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 gentleman on the left is a young Mick Jagger. Yeah, he really was that young once. And in the 60s, he and his Rolling Stones wrote a song about uh, these uh, so-called nerve pills uh, entitled it Mother's Little Helpers. Uh, men just aren't the same today. I hear every mother say they just don't appreciate that you get tired they're so hard to satisfy. You can tranquilize your mind. So go running for the shelter of a mother's little helper and four, help you through the night, help to minimize your plight. Doctor, please, some more of these outside the door. She took four more. What a drag it is getting old. Well, Mick ought to know about that by now. But uh, uh, he uh, had a, a not so... A uh, rosy view on these mothers' little uh, helpers. Uh, and if you take more of those, you will get an overdose. No more running for the shelter of your mother's little helper. It'll help you on your way to your busy dying day. Uh, and uh, this brings us to Karen Ann Quinlan, who uh, 
a very famous right to die case, perhaps the most famous right to die case. Karen was a beautiful young woman, a little on, uh, in her estimation, she was a little on the beefy side. She didn't, um, uh, like a lot of ladies, she uh, held the opinion that you could never be too thin. And she was doing a crash diet in April of 1975. And, uh, she went partying and she took some Valium with alcohol and she went home with some friends or she went home and she uh, laid down and she stopped breathing. Her friends went to check on her and found her there not breathing and they uh, performed CPR on her, called an ambulance. Uh, she was got CPR twice and then the ambulance uh, guys uh, also did life-saving things with her. When she got to the hospital, she was already in a coma, uh, and she never really regained uh, consciousness. Uh, but uh, uh, there's a very famous life support that her uh, lawsuit was launched uh, that her parents uh, uh, wanted to let her die, uh, wanted to let her go peacefully and not keep her alive by artificial means once it then once it was clear that she was not going to recover she was never going to be all right uh and uh, a thing about the quinlan case that wasn't publicized a lot as people think about this young woman uh uh she was in when she was in a coma she wasn't just lying there she was in a semi-vegetative state uh when she got to the hospital, she didn't react to any stimuli to see if she would come out of it. They may do a knuckle rub down your sternum, which is kind of painful, and, uh, or, or poke you uh, with a needle or something to see if you'll draw back or flinch or respond to, uh, to uh, pain stimuli, which Karen did not. Uh, but she came uh, up to a point where she was uh, uh, for nine years in a semi-vegetative state. They had to feed her uh, through a tube uh, and she eventually died of complications associated with pneumonia. But she didn't just lie there passing away radiant and peaceful. She had all kinds of physiological changes that took place with her. Uh, and uh, she uh, would respond to some stimuli. She didn't, uh, you know, when they would, the nurses and uh, things uh, right, and, and medical people would try to take care of her, uh, she would thrash and be combative and resist and draw away from. Uh, and her parents uh, couldn't stand that. They couldn't stand it. And uh, uh, so they won their lawsuit and they took her off of life support and she lived another nine years before dying of uh, complications from pneumonia. Terrifically sad case. But uh, uh, a question coming out of that, uh, what happened? People take Valiums and drink all the time, wash them down. I've done that, God knows how many times I've washed Valium down with a slug of whiskey. Or a, or a beer or two, quaaludes too. Uh, so, you know, and I guess I'm lucky to be here telling you about it. I'm not bragging, trust me on that. Uh, uh, but this young woman, uh, I don't know. You know, I'm still kind of fascinated by the case. Uh, were her friends lying? Did she do something else? Did she take more? That hadn't been established. Uh, uh, what it looks like is she had an idiosyncratic response. Uh, the little bit of value that she took, and uh, it wasn't a lot, uh, mixed with the alcohol in such a way that it killed this young woman. Did her crash diet with her not having anything much to eat at all for two days have something to do with that? Maybe. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's sad. The volume of the benzodiazepines brought us something else. Nikki Finn rides again. Uh, from the trazepam, uh, also known as rohypnol or rupees, or rufies, uh, are, um, is not available in the U.S. by prescription. You can get it in Canada, you can get it in New Mexico. Uh, and uh, people who are 
uh, in Canada or Mexico that have a script written for them for their medication can bring it into the country. Uh, it's not illegal to bring your medicine into the country with you. Uh, but if you're bringing it in for distribution, well, my goodness, why didn't that wall stop you? Uh, the, uh, it causes dissociative symptoms. Uh, and uh, I think you ladies know already that if you're, uh, you, you uh, it's, it's a shame, but you have to be aware of your surroundings. You just have to be aware of what's going on with uh, you know, you have to look around you when you go out into the parking lot and head for your car. You have to, you know, be vigilant uh, because there are people out there who will do you harm. Uh, and you see these two <coughs> young ladies having a swell time and this disembodied hand coming out with a pill to drop something in their drinks. That's date rape. If you drug someone in order to have sex with them, that's sexual assault. And sexual assault, as you know, is common as dirt in the United States of America because we largely live in a right culture. Uh, but uh, there's dissociative symptoms that occur uh, with that. Uh, uh, you, the, the, the predator will drop something in the, the lady's drink, uh, he comes over, he's talking to her, he's visiting with her, she gets to staggering and slurring her words, and he says, I'll take her home, uh, and uh, that's not what happens. There's a, a good film, I'm not assigning it to you right now, maybe I'll do that in some other class some other time, but it's called The Hunting Ground, and it was produced... Um, Oh, several years ago, not long ago, maybe within the last five years. Uh, and uh, you can probably find it on, you know, Netflix or something if you want to uh, look look for it. Uh, come to think of it, I think I will f see if I can find it and post it on there for an extra credit assignment. But uh, The Hunting Ground uh, uh, talks uh, it's about uh, sexual assault on college campuses and College campuses for, for young women who live in dormitories are, are dangerous places. They are dangerous places, and I don't like to say that. I mean, we don't have any dorms, really, at Lee College. But uh, uh, And as these young women were telling their stories uh, in uh, this film, almost all of them began with, I was drinking at a party. Uh, and that's where the story begins. That's definitely not where it ends. These drugs are dangerous when they're mixed with alcohol. They incapacitate people. They cause dissociative symptoms so that people who are sexually assaulted while under the influence of rohypnol uh, very often re report they know what's happening to them, but they're unable to do anything to prevent it. And uh, as a number of uh, women have, uh, uh, have said that, you know, it's like I'm standing outside my body uh, and seeing this happen, but there's nothing I can do. There's also a kicker to this one, too. Uh, men are victimized uh, also. It's, uh, you know, you don't think because you're a guy this thing can't happen to you either. Uh, but wait a minute, Bush Hart, you just said a while ago that taking these type of medications, I won't be able to get erect for what's going to happen to you, you won't have to be. So, just saying. Uh, and they're dangerous drugs. Uh, uh, people have been dosed with this and died from it because of the respiratory effect that occurs when you mix this central nervous system depressant with that central nervous system depressant. Remember when we, uh, uh, a chapter or two ago, we were talking about cumulative effects, additive effects, and synergistic effects? This is a synergistic effect. These two things multiply the effects of each of these things. So two and two doesn't equal four. Two and two is equaling eight and 12 and 17. Uh, and the respiratory effect uh, uh, it can be tremendously enhanced. And next thing you know, uh, these young ladies are dead. Then there are non-benzodiazepine, hypnotic, Z-drugs, Zolpidem, sold as Ambien, 
uh, Zaloplan sold as Sonata, Ezopaclon. I have a real tough time saying that. I just usually call it Lunesta, Ezopaclon. Uh, and of course, there are others on the way. These are prescription uh, drugs, too. Uh, but there are uh, also non-benzodiazepine hypnotics that aren't really, uh, they have a CNS depressant effect, but that's not really uh, the benefit of these drugs. Benadryl, diphenhydramine, uh, is a, an histamine, and it's to help you breathe better and stop having post-nasal drip, which is good. At, at that, uh, but it also has a depressing effect, and it makes you sleepy sometimes, and uh, uh, makes people sleepy most of the time. Makes me stupid too. I mean, I can take a, a you know some Benadryl, and I couldn't spell cat if you spotted me ca. You know, it's, uh, so I might as well just go to sleep. Uh, but um, uh, so there, uh, there, there are drugs that are repurposed for for something else. One's been in the news a lot lately, uh, the hydroxychloroquine, uh, which is a, a quinine derivative, and it's usually prescribed to treat lupus and also malaria. Uh, and it was rumored to have done something wonderful and marvelous uh, for people who have, uh, 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 who have uh, COVID-19. It does not. It is not approved for that use, and it has shown little to no effectiveness in most uh, studies. And in some studies, it looked like it made things worse. But that doesn't stop people from taking drugs uh, that they think will work or that they, uh, uh, you know, yeah, that they think will work or someone's told them that they'll work. The uh, <coughs> If you're taking a drug that you think will work, and it makes you feel better, even though there is no chemical, biological reason for that drug to make you feel better, then probably what you're getting is uh, uh, called a placebo effect. And placebo effects, uh, you know, uh, they're, uh, I'm not saying they're not real. You can get placebo pain relief that's very real because the pain's alleviated, you know. You can get placebo effects if you take something that you think is going to help you sleep and you believe in it and it helps you sleep. A placebo effect doesn't mean that you don't get a good benefit out of it. It just means that there's nothing that the drug's doing to cause those benefits. It's, it's something else at work there. Anyway, uh, when you look at Zolpidem uh, and uh, Zeloplin and Lunesta, uh, I said that a lot better, didn't I? Uh, is Zopaclone, Zopaclone, uh, yeah, anyway, uh, the, uh, uh, it, uh, it, uh, uh, helps you get sleep faster, and it causes you to sleep longer, uh, you may wake up in the morning groggy, and that, it doesn't matter what they say about that. About it. you know, it helps you sleep, and you wake up refreshed. You may not wake up refreshed. You may uh, wake up with a hypnotic hangover, uh, and that's quite common. <laughs> you know that you feel uh, uh, groggy in the morning. And with me, uh, you know, I'm pretty cranky if I take this stuff. So I'm not a fit guy to be around if I had to take, uh, uh, you know, hypnotics. And I don't take hypnotics, by the way, just in case you're wondering. I, uh, and I never really did therapeutically. I took them for other reasons back in the day. Not these, not the, not the Z drugs, because they weren't available to me. But if they had have been available, I would have. You know, I was a product of my environment, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the the 1960s, leave no turn on stone. Uh, some things to consider. Anxiolytics, uh, when one becomes addicted to them, manifest the same symptoms that the drugs are prescribed to treat when the user is going through withdrawal. If you, uh, if you come to the doctor and you tell them you have these vague fears, you can't, you're just afraid, you can't 
you're worried about stuff and you can't put your finger on what it is you're worried about. There, it's just like you feel the world's about to fall apart and it's not even an election year. Uh, the, uh, you know, you can't sleep, you can't concentrate, uh, these types of things, they'll probably prescribe an anxiolytic for you. It'll probably be Xanax uh, at, in this stage of the game. Maybe Valium, but Xanax is largely replaced Valium, uh, Alprazolam. Uh, and it'll, it'll help. It'll manage the symptoms. And, uh, you know, there's been debates about, you know, whether these drugs should be used as widely as they are. The debate goes something like this. Uh, well, all it does when you take these things, it just makes you not feel the anxiety. It doesn't really treat the source of the anxiety. No, it doesn't. It's not a treatment to make it go away. It's a treatment to manage it, uh, to, to make it not... Uh, well, it does make it go away. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't repair the source of the anxiety. It just makes the symptoms alleviate. Uh, and now you're not having panic attacks, and now you're not hyperventilating, and now you can concentrate, and now you can go outside and live your life. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of physicians who say, what the hell's wrong with that? That's what we do with almost all medicines. Why all of a sudden is wrong for this one, you know? Uh, and they have a point. But there's another thing. Uh, and that's, suppose you don't have these symptoms. Suppose you're just out in a cow pasture at a kegger with your buddies and somebody breaks out some bars and you start eating them and you go, wow, this is the best thing uh, since ketchup on uh, beans, you know. Uh, and, uh, the, and now that's all you want to do is just eat bars. Well, if you decide that you're going to stop eating those bars, Part of your withdrawal syndrome will be an appearance of symptoms where you have vague fears that you can't put your finger on, feel like the world's falling apart, but you don't know why. You can't sleep. You're worried about stuff. Uh, you can't concentrate, etc., and so forth. What does that sound like? Does that sound like an anxiety disorder to you? It sure does. You know what you use to, uh, to treat anxiety disorders? The drug that's causing you to have them. It's what you use to treat it. So it, you can see you might be in a little bit of a, of a circle, uh, you know, what they call the cycle of addiction there with that. Um, so anxiolytics are not, uh, you know, like I said, it, it, for what they're administered for and used the way that they're suggested to be used, et cetera, and so forth, they're not particularly dangerous or anything like that. But uh, if you're using higher dosages and you become addicted to them, then when you come off of that, then you see this type of thing. Uh, also uh, recall, too, that they put your uh, central nervous system out of balance. And so that even with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, these type of drugs, you can see some dangerous withdrawals. In the 80s, Alprazolam began to uh, displace uh, Valium in popularity. Uh, and so you're getting people who were once taking 10 milligrams of Valium a day are now taking Xanax. But the doctor's prescribing the Xanax to them in two and a half milligram dosages. And you have little old granny ladies out there going, well, that ain't right, you know. Uh, when I was taking my other medicine, it was 10 milligrams. Now he's giving me two and a half milligrams. That ain't enough. Uh, so they take four, you know, and 10 milligrams of Xanax is a lot more depression uh, uh, of the central nervous system than you get uh, with Valium because it's a stronger drug. And so now you have little granny ladies flopping around out there and uh, overdose situations, and when they decide that they're going to stop taking the medicine, and people do decide this, they just decide, I'm not going to take it anymore, uh, and uh, withdrawal symptoms start to emerge, then one of those withdrawals is convulsions, and that's a dangerous uh, situation to find yourself in. So if you're working with clients 
you need to make a determination, you know, have they been taking CNS depressants? How long have they been taking them? What kind have they been taking? And things like that. Uh, so you know what to expect. And if, uh, and if they're showing uh, withdrawal symptoms, it's a good idea to refer them right away uh, for, for medical uh, uh, evaluation, if nothing else. They may not need treatment, but to, to evaluate whether or not they, they will need treatment because just stopping some of the, uh, just stopping taking this family of drugs, these types of drugs, these depressant drugs, uh, can create a life-threatening withdrawal syndrome. Physical dependence uh, uh, is uh, indicated anytime you have that. Anytime you have withdrawal, you can say that there, here's an individual who's uh, uh, physiologically addicted to the substance. And when you're talking about this huge category of drugs, and as I said before, it's real hard to get your clients to get their heads around it, uh, if you're an alcoholic, you can't safely take any of these drugs because of the cross-addictive properties. And it's really, it, and I talk about it in terms of cross-addiction, but it's still an addiction to the same category of drugs. If you're addicted to, to, to narcotics drugs, it doesn't matter if you're addicted to laudanum or heroin or morphine or opium or codeine or, you know, fentanyl or whatever. You're addicted to the narcotics, and if you're addicted to one of them, you're addicted to all of them, and it's the same with this. And there's a huge uh, category of, um, of um, there's, there, like I said, this is a huge category of drugs. There are thousands of these things that can cause you problems. <sighs> you with me still? No one's passed out. No one's got their face on their desk going, is it ever going to stop? Types of inhalants, it will stop pretty soon. Uh, and here's some, uh, uh, and, and if you look at these, you can tell it uh, uh, by when we get in a discussion of how they use, uh, how they're used, they weren't really designed to be used this way. Uh, you have liquids, aerosols, gases, nitrites, uh, uh, and uh, they're not meant for human consumption. Uh, wait a minute, Bushard, I like Ready Whip. Yeah, yeah, the, the whip is good. The gas that pushes it out of the can is what the user's looking for, not the, not the Ready Whip itself. So, uh, and there are lots of household things. If you're, if you're looking at, uh, you know, at kids and you're saying, how do I keep my kids off of drugs? How, can, how do I, I keep them away from things that will get them high? Uh, man, every house in America has got something a kid can get high on in here. Uh, if not rifling through mom's uh, uh, medicine cabinet for, uh, for uh, uh, prescription medication or dad's liquor cap cabinet for something to drink and, and uh, copping beers out of the fridge that's in the garage and unlocked, <laughs> you know, uh, they may be looking around for these kind of cans and those kind of cans and these kind of cans and they shouldn't be finding a lot of these unless something, uh, uh, you know, uh, untoward is going on usually. Uh, anyway, but they can find all of this around the house and, uh, and uh, get high on it and kids do. Uh, inhalants are CNS depressants. Those are the things that they're looking for to get high on. Uh, and so, some inhalants are extremely dangerous, extremely dangerous. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, Freon, uh, kids can sniff Freon, but it's very tricky to do it. Uh, you can wind up dead sniffing Freon uh, real quick, by the way. Uh, a lot of these things have toxic agents in it that will uh, uh, cause death. There may be, some of them may have lead in them. I think they've tried to de-lead everything that they can by now. Uh, this is a big problem, by the way, in the third world. Uh, so that if you're going down into Central America, if you're going into Honduras and, uh, uh, or Belize City, or something like that, and you're in town, you may have to step over some of these kids who are passed out on the sidewalk with their bag in their hand. Uh, 
kids are looking for who are looking for something to sniff generally look at the labels and if it tells you to use you know in a well ventilated area avoid exposure to the fumes don't breathe this that's what they're looking for uh, and it might be something uh, with a, a paint thinner uh, that uh, they can breathe and get high on and it might be something like a toilet bowl cleaner uh, heavy acidified uh, that they breathe and they don't get high they get their lungs blistered and they develop pneumonia and they die inhalants are a particular uh, problem with like I said with kids with poor people too or people who are in conditions where they can't do other things You'll find this going on in jailhouses when someone gets some Texas Shine Boy or something or a can of paint uh, from the uh, uh, from the uh, garage area that gets smuggled into the cells. And next thing you know, here are all these grown people who, if they were outside, would not do any inhalants. But because they're locked up and can't get high any other way, they don't mind so much. You know, leave no turn unstoned. These volatile solvents, by the way, you can find in your uh, book. I don't recall uh, uh, which uh, particular, let me see if I can find it over here. I'll look in my book. Uh, there is, uh, there are these boxes, table, uh, uh, there's table 7.1 uh, point that tells you some popular sedative hyp hypnotics and, and, uh, uh, then there's uh, table 7.2 that shows some chemicals abused by inhalation, and they've got these uh, particular products listed. Uh, paint and paint thinners. Uh, once upon a time, I was painting houses with my uh, friend Pee Wee's father, Hank, uh, and we had a job where we were out at this house and we were putting a, a uh, this uh, lacquer uh, stuff, the shiny paint uh, on the uh, trim, on the uh, baseboards and things. And my job uh, was to, we, we uh, put a, a primer on it and I ran down and, uh, on my hands and knees and was uh, sandpapering the primer and then Ronnie Thurman uh, was coming along behind me and uh, spraying this, uh, this lacquer uh, onto the uh, uh, baseboards and making it look pretty. But the next thing you know, Ronnie and I were buzzed as hell off of that uh, uh, thinner uh, that was being used uh, in, the, in the paint. Uh, and I know I was pretty loaded and uh, had some interesting experiences that afternoon. Uh, Ronnie uh, took his paint gun into the closet, sprayed the closet full of paint, was sitting in there on a bucket singing Lucille loud as anything. Uh, and uh, it was an interesting job. Painters used to do, uh, 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 you could tell industrial painters a lot anyway, uh, because they staggered when they walked. Uh, and it was like they were drunk. They had inhaled enough of this stuff that it was doing organic brain damage and it was affecting their balance. Uh, so old time industrial painters would be staggering around and slurring their words like they're drunk when they're not. And uh, not, they may not even be intoxicated. This is a chronic effect of exposure uh, to these types of things. Paint removers, toluene, petroleum distillates, esters, acetone, methanol. Uh, all of these things cause uh, uh, over protracted uh, periods of use over time will cause um, changes in the central nervous system, actually damage to the central nervous system uh, that will make you uh, uh, stagger around in things, affect you physically. Uh, the uh, and this can happen very fast with some of them. Uh, this, is a, this is why it's uh, imperative if you've got a client, particularly young clients who are doing this kind of thing, to intervene and intervene quickly because it does not take long uh, using volatile solvents to cause brain damage that will be irreparable. Uh, 
aerosols, propellants, gases, spray paint, butane, uh, toluene, hydrocarbons, uh, uh, propane, gasoline, nitrous oxide, difluorethane, uh, all of these are uh, intoxicants that are found in these and there are other elements found in these that uh, are dangerous too. Uh, the, it's not just the intoxicant chemicals that are in there but there are other uh, chemicals that uh, are in there that is just bad news. Uh, one of the most dangerous of the, uh, of the uh, inhalants that you can use are the anesthetics. Abuse is extremely dangerous because these are things that, uh, uh, like nitrous oxide, uh, you, uh, the dentist will put a mask on a kid and the kid will be uh, really drunk and not feeling any pain while the uh, dentist is in there filling a tooth or snatching one out or doing something else. Uh, and uh, this is a dangerous drug. Uh, it doesn't take a, a lot more inhaling the nitrous oxide uh, to, to the amount that it takes to create an intoxication event and the amount that it takes to put you in an anesthetic coma and stop your breathing uh, is not much. There's not much difference. Halothane, enflurane, ether, chloroform, all of these things are uh, awfully uh, dangerous uh, because of the trickiness of the dosage to get you where you want to go. Uh, you might go somewhere you don't want to go. Then there are these guys, amyl and butyl nitrates, poppers, jacarama, odor of men, uh, ram, rush, hard war, locker room, uh, I like this one, fuck, <laughs> spell P-H-U-C. Uh, anyway, uh, sex. If you read the labels, it kind of gives you an idea of what you're going to do with these chemicals, right? And the amyl and butyl nitrate poppers, you used to get, get these at uh, uh, adult bookstores. Uh, I guess you still could. Uh, and uh, uh, they... Um, uh, these are drugs that uh, if you, uh, I'm going to try to be nice saying this, if you're engaged in coitus and you get to the point where you're going to have an orgasm and you happen to have these handy, you uh, uh, inhale a popper uh, at the moment of orgasm and it creates intensity. Uh, the, the, the orgasm is... Uh, uh, reportedly longer and stronger uh, and more intense, uh, which is kind of what people are shooting for. Uh, the, uh, these were also popular in gay clubs uh, because uh, for the orgasmic purpose, but also because they are CNS depressants. They uh, uh, relax the sphincter muscle and make it easier to have anal sex. Uh, so that was uh, another thing. Uh, they're not, I don't, you know, you don't hear about people overdosing on this stuff much. And, and if there's any kind of a physiological complication that comes from abusing the amyl and butyl nitrate poppers, uh, it's, um, you know, if you have something already wrong with you, uh, if you have some weakness that, uh, uh, that uh, the, drug can exacerbate and, you know, uh, for instance, a blood vessel popping or something along those lines, a uh, heart attack. The, but uh, again, these are uh, amyl and butyl nitrate are not necessarily for recreational use. So you're doing some drugs that are, uh, some substances that are meant for other things. Uh, and that can always be risky business. Brings us to gamma hydroxybutyric acid, GHB. It's very similar to the uh, neurotransmitter, the uh, inhibitory neurotransmitter, GABA, uh, gamma amino butyric uh, acid. Uh, so structurally, it's uh, pretty close to the same thing. Uh, and this is a sedative. This is also a date rape drug. Uh, it produces a short and intense intoxication. 
if you combine it with alcohol, like you do, uh, to uh, uh, to uh, utilize it as a date rape drug, it can be uh, very dangerous. Uh, it never really caught on uh, as, as a, considered kind of a club drug, a rave drug, uh, back in the uh, 90s. And uh, it never really caught on beyond that much. Uh, it's, it has been and is abused, but it's not something that's common way people are seeking out to do. Uh, it is a uh, Schedule II drug. Its only medical use is to treat a, uh, is to treat a form of uh, narcolepsy called cataplexy. Uh, and it uh, and it does that. There's no other uh, prescription for it. It hasn't been uh, repurposed for anything else that I'm aware of so far. Uh, so, in conclusion, uh, the CNS depressants are a very large family of drugs, and its subdivisions include very large categories of drugs of other families uh, of substances in there. Most CNS depressants are addictive and they're cross-addictive. So that if you're addicted to one, you're addicted to all. Uh, and, well, wait a minute, I haven't tried them all. How do I know that? Uh, take my word for it. Or not. <laughs> you know, it's uh, uh, whether you believe they are or whether you don't believe they are is really kind of irrelevant when you get right down to it, don't you think? Uh, so you'll find out if you continue to do these things. And I'm not suggesting anyone engage in any field research. Uh, but it, it, it does, it becomes really hard to uh, 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 sometimes to talk to clients about this and, and to caution them or to inform them, to educate them about uh, uh, the nature of addiction and that uh, uh, you know, uh, drug users uh, will play with their own minds about, well, you know, alcohol is my drug of choice, so it's perfectly okay for me to use uh, methamphetamine as a whole different kind of drug, and it is a whole different kind of drug. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's not a safe drug for you to use. Uh, it's not, if you're an uh, alcoholic, if you're addicted to alcohol, the central nervous system depressant, it is definitely not okay to be uh, taking things like Runesta, you know, or uh, the benzodiazepines, or the barbiturates, or uh, using the uh, inhalants, or whatever. Uh, so, uh, by fooling around with other substances, you're liable to either trigger the old addiction again and have a relapse situation, or you'll develop a totally new type of addiction, and maybe you'll have two or three types of addictions going on at the same time. Whew! Uh, better living through chemistry, ladies and gentlemen. And that brings us to the end of another exciting installment of uh, Drug Society and Human Behavior. And we'll have another one forthcoming here in a short while. Uh, and uh, we're coming along very well so far in the class. Uh, uh, there's a few of you who have um, uh, not uh, completed your assignments. You're not current on your assignments, and I encourage you uh, to do that because we're here around the halfway mark now. Uh, in this particular class, and um, anyway, it'd be nice if you did. Uh, the um, uh, next installment is forthcoming, and I will uh, talk to you soon. I'll also post the PowerPoint on the uh, website for you. Okay. Bye.